FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz, and it's 12 19 19. And put that in your numerological book and smoke it because I don't know what it means, but it must mean something good because we're almost at the end of the year and it's been an amazing year. And to cap it all off, we've got our good friend Martin Armstrong from ArmstrongEconomics.com here with us. He's just released or is releasing uh, his seminal work i call it a treatise an economic treatise entitled manipulating the world economy the rise of modern monetary theory and the inevitable fall of classical economics which is really sad and then a a tagline is there an alternative so martin great to have you back on this book Uh, i started reading it i got it a few days ago it is a lengthy read it's uh, if you're looking for the cliff notes, uh, I don't know. Uh, maybe it's uh, maybe it's on audiobook. I haven't even checked it. I'm actually going to read the entirety of this book because it really takes it from the beginning and looking at the table of contents, which is quite quite extensive. Uh, we go from how did we get here? Behavioral economics, the excess, obsession with foreign fixed foreign exchange rates, and that. It has a whole bunch of subheadings. Why the euro failed as a reserve currency, which is a really good question. The quantity theory of money, which we were kind of raised on, and its failure. Uh, so much, so much more. Uh, I really want to read the velocity of money because that is an important factor, and it's been going down. Existence of the business cycle, and it goes through history: uh, the Roman financial crisis of 33 A.D., the Athenian crisis of 354 BC, Julius Caesar and the debt crisis. So Caesar came about largely because of the debt crisis. Uh, we got so much more here, but the conclusion, the way out, which we will talk about a bit. Martin, first, uh, how long did you spend writing this book? Um, well, I, I guess it's kind of like um, my whole life in a way, but I mean, it took me to write maybe about four to six weeks. Wow. Um, How'd you do that that quickly? This is a 450 some odd page book. I'm a pretty prolific writer. Um, <clears throat> plus, I was uh, in Asia for three months. So um, that kind of helped get me out of the um, the normal daily run. So I had something to do. While I was over there and uh, it's. But it's it's kind of like uh, I don't know Picasso's famous line when somebody asked him to do a a, a sketch of him and <clears throat> he said sure and then said you know you know here's the bill ten thousand dollars they said it only <laughs> took you three minutes he says but it took me my whole life to get to that <laughs> hey, and the the book is amazing uh, I'd imagine the editing probably took longer than the writing of the book because getting it all down on paper is just where your writing begins, but uh, this is a, an inspired work. And what really made you, what was the final thing that said, I got to write this because nobody else is doing it? Well, I had so many people asking me um, because mainly you have this new monetary theory coming up and um, just to print money, et cetera. And it, Largely what they're saying, um, any of these things are like half truths. They look at it and say, okay, fine. We've had, you know, quantitative easing for 10 years and no inflation. So obviously you can print whatever you want and there'll be no inflation. That's their conclusion. And, you know, a lot of people go, well, that makes sense. Look what happened. You know, but, you know, they're not looking at everything that is happening. And that's where the velocity of money comes into play. Uh, it, it really depends upon what people are doing. If they have no confidence in the in really the the system per se, then they will hoard the money. And that's why I I dealt with the Roman situation. I mean, there are hordes of even the you know the bronze coins which were you know debased. 
as long as they felt that they could spend them, they hoarded them. So it, it's a question of really what people believe. And, and the hyperinflation that people misconstrue is a collapse in the confidence of government. So that uh, at that stage in the game, you're not sure if the currency is going to last. And so you spend it as fast as you get it. And um, I went into the German hyperinflation. And I mean, because that is something that has caused the austerity in Europe. And it's completely bogus. Um, You know, they, they go, oh, it was the printing of money. It was not. You know, what people don't realize is that in December 23, the government simply said, OK, fine, everybody, um, here are these bonds and you must turn over 10 percent of everything you're worth and we'll give you a bond. It was a forced loan. Once that happened, you, the the currency went into basically hyperinflation, really, because people just felt that, that that's it. Now they're just confiscating 10 percent of everything I have. Um, so it's not just printing money. You know, it, it, but people try to make these things sound, oh, well, reduce it just to a single cause and effect. And it's not true. The velocity of money will show you it's been declining recently. Why? Because people were hoarding money. So you've made interest rates negative in Europe. <clears throat> what did they do? They pulled the money out of the bank, banks and they stuck it, you know, in shoeboxes. Okay, so they're hoarding it. Well, why aren't they spending? Because they have no faith in the future. As long as they don't see things are going to be um, rising in price next year, then they hoard the money. Going into 1980, uh, the reason gold rallied, but it it wasn't just gold. I mean, they were hoarding toilet paper. The perception was that uh, the, the dollar, whatever you were looking at, if it was anything from toilet paper, food, whatever, uh, cars, I better spend the dollars today because it's, it's only going to be more expensive tomorrow. You have to get to that point. When you get to that point, now you start getting into a higher velocity of money. People will now spend it and not hoard it. We're still in the hoarding phase. So um, t- like take, All these people keep talking about the crash of the stock market. We're still at nearly 50 percent levels of 2007. People are still hoarding cash. All right. They're they're not rushing back in and buying the stock market. That will come. All right. And then the Dow will break out to the upside and and you're going to see 40,000 before you're ever going to see, you know, 10,000. Um, so it, this is just the way it is. It, it depends upon what people perceive the future will be. And often the velocity of money is a very, very important indicator nobody bothers to look at. Um, so this quantity theory of money fails. It has failed every time. Um, you have you know, all these people saying, oh, you know, the quantitative easing was going to be hyperinflation. Nothing happened. Mm. Um, you have to understand what's going on. And we're also in a global economy. So, um, I mean, I you know, was basically the one yelling at the Fed down in Washington and, and kind of forced them to change. They were just buying in 30 year bonds. And, you know, the House Banking Committee was calling me. I said, this is stupid because, number one, they think purely domestic. Gee, I'll buy in these 30 year bonds that will stimulate the economy by putting more cash in the system. You're assuming only an American is selling you that 30 year bond. China reduced, they sold all their 30s and said, thank you very much, and reduced their maturity to five years or less. You know, so the money goes out of the country. It didn't stay. So, I mean, it's like, Oh, gee, I never thought about that. Yeah, I said, this is a problem. <laughs> These people with their theories are all domestic oriented. And I mean, in school, I mean, Keynesianism and all this, it has no relevance to the world economy. Because it's like, oh, we'll increase money supply or, or you know, interest rates or whatever, as if nothing outside the country matters. Yeah, and it's just that just doesn't 
It's not the way the world works. It's kind of like uh, you go to the doctor's office and you tell him he has, you have a sore throat and he says, lie down on the table and drop your pants. And he starts looking up your rear to try to figure out what's wrong with your throat. Right. Yeah. It's just completely nuts. It's, um, it, it's, <clears throat> we ended up with this domestic oriented analysis and that's why, you know, classical economics is failing. Um, and it's, and you can see the logic behind the modern monetary theory. Well, if we increase money supply for 10 years and nothing happened, then we can do it forever. You know, this is what they come back with. And they just are missing the entire point here. So that's largely what everybody was asking me, please do this book. We need some, somebody to stand up and explain this stuff. Um, and honestly, I mean, I was, I went to three of the top universities in Europe <clears throat> and actually, actually three of the top 10 in the world, um, had lunch with them and I was surprised why they even asked, invited me and they asked me if I would teach there. And I looked at him and I said, well, why? You know, and I said, I'm not, I'm not interested <laughs> in teaching a class. Uh, and they actually said to me, we know what we teach doesn't work. But, you know, those of us that have actually hands-on experience in, in, in the world, nobody wants to go back. And who wants to teach a, some class with 30 kids in it? I mean, it's, I said, look, I'll be glad to come to a guest lecture, you know, but <laughs> I'm not interested in that. Yeah, why would they said, you? that's the problem. Nobody is. I said, <laughs> well, you know, what, what can I tell you? So that's kind of why I did this book. And maybe then somebody else will stand up and say, go over the book in a classroom. So what about the Austrians, though? They seem to have a better fix on things because they do understand that when you monkey with interest rates and you monkey with with regulation, it inhibits the voluntary interaction of citizens uh, of the world for that matter because we're in a global economy now and it, it it really inhibits the ability to to transact business and through the transaction of business that's what transmits the uh, information that we need to make informed decisions pricing etc so aren't the austrians on the right track yes and no um <clears throat> It's yes, from the standpoint that that's why I call the book Manipulating the World Economy, uh, because under Keynesianism, that's basically what it's all about. And Keynes really just adopted Marx. I mean, um, just not doing communism, per se. But Marx is really the first person who said, gee, we can manipulate everything to make a system the way it should be, according to him. Um, the Austrians, where they go wrong, is still based upon the quantity theory of money, which applied when you were talking about uh, the money supply being really just coins. OK, then evolving into paper money was still not so bad, uh, but it was really more or less after the fall of Brenton Woods is when things began to change. The, the reason they would borrow rather than print was in part because of the Austrian view, that the theory was that if you borrowed, you didn't create money, you were taking some money out of the system, so therefore it was less inflationary. But in the 60s, if you had savings bonds and you went to the bank and you said, I want to borrow against these to buy a car, they said, sorry, it's illegal. So they could not lend against the government bond. So therefore, at that up to that point in time, that theory was correct. Once you, you cross that line, you want to trade futures, what do you do? You can buy T-bills and post them as collateral. Okay, so now government debt is simply money that pays interest. It's no longer illegal to borrow against it. It used to be. So you've changed that part of the theory, too. So why do we borrow if we have no intention of paying anything back? <laughs> and we've gotten lost in our theories here. I mean, it's just like it doesn't make any sense. I mean, I meet with people in various different governments and I ask them, why, why are you borrowing if you don't 
intend to pay back. And they just look at you with a dumb look and they go, well, that's what we're supposed to do. I said, really? <laughs> um, yeah. So there are no answers. Nobody's looked at this stuff. It, it's, it's been uh, kind of like the Federal Reserve, which I also go get, you know, I go into. Um, when the Fed was first created, it was created properly. All right. It was really a bailout fund and the banks. Yes, they were shareholders because they had to put up their own money. The taxpayer wasn't doing it. So if they were going to stimulate the economy, they would do it because the banks would stop lending. So then they would buy in corporate paper. That system was correct. And it was mirroring basically what the private sector had been doing since the 1850s. Then World War I comes into play and suddenly the government says, oh, gee, we're going to have to issue a lot more debt. So they told the Fed that they had to buy government bonds and not corporate. World War I passes. They never put it back. World War II comes. Oh, well, gee, we're, uh, we have to really do this. So we need two things. One, they usurped all the interest rates around the country and put it in Washington and one rate fit all where all the branches before were independent. So you would have 7% in New York and 6% in Dallas. One, you know, If there was a shortage of money, they would raise it higher than New York to attract money to that region. That's the way the Fed was originally designed, to balance out the capital flows domestically. So World War II comes. They made it one interest rate. Then I also go into this book, something of most people have no clue even took place. The Treasury then told the Fed they had to support the U.S. bond market at par throughout World War II. So the Fed was under orders to do that. It was a first version of quantitative easing. They didn't buy it in. They just guaranteed that floor. So if it ever went below, they would buy it, which was different than what they were doing in 07 to 09. So <clears throat> Then 1951 comes, and what happens is then the Korean War is coming. Now the Fed has been doing this, and then the Fed revolted. And they stood up and they said, we're not going to do this anymore. This is crazy. And so um, unilaterally, the Fed just rejected it and said, nope, we're not going to support the U.S. government bonds anymore. And then the interest rates started moving you know, freely. Um, so. Then you come up with this, you know, too big to fail stuff. I mean, they changed the laws again. I mean, literally, the Federal Reserve could take over McDonald's if it wants. I mean, it's mm. it's that vague. Mm. It doesn't even have to be a bank anymore. So, what, I mean, it, we have gone so far from what the original theory of a central bank was supposed to be. Who knows? And now you have um, over there in Europe. You have Lagarde saying, oh, well, we're going to support climate change policy and support. Where does central bank now getting involved in climate change? <laughs> yeah, um, not exactly their charter. Hey, what about it, Vietnam and guns and butter? Uh, they were an essential part of guns and butter, weren't they? Well, they were independent at that stage in the game. The, the government was was. Um, basically trying a lot to always manipulate various different things. And this is the what kind of what the book goes into, that um, all this manipulation has failed to ever do anything. I've quoted even like some of the Fed chairmen. I mean, Burns, who said, you know, this doesn't work. Volcker, who came out and, I mean, there's a book you can get. They're kind of rare because they don't want to ever reprint it, but <laughs> they'll go for maybe 300 bucks or something. It's called Rediscovering the Business Cycle. Mm -hmm. He came out um, in, I think it was 1977. I mean, after the, the 74 crash, and he said, okay, fine. The, the, the crash in the economy and everything else he called it rediscovering the business cycle because Keynesianism failed. And he, had, he goes in there, he says, this new economic theory doesn't work. So, I mean, it's I'm not the only person to have ever noticed some of these things. It's just that nobody does anything about it. 
And so this book is mainly trying to pull it all together to say, here, this is it. Uh, This is what they've been doing since Mm -hmm. the beginning. And, you know, we have to really take a look at this because, I mean, the, the problem is an individual. I mean, everybody's parents said, look, don't stick your finger in the in the flame of a candle because it's going to hurt. <laughs> Every kid does because right. he wants to see for himself. Yeah, because you don't right. believe them. Say, so, oh, what if they're wrong? What if yeah. I've got superhuman powers? <laughs> but we learn from that experience. We now don't go back and stick our finger in the, into the flame. However, collectively as society, we never learned a damn thing. Um, every crisis comes up. Nobody asks, gee, has this ever happened before? What did they try? Did it work? No, none of these questions are ever, ever asked. They come up, oh, well, let's, we should do this. Oh, that sounds good. Yeah, okay, fine. Right, so question for you. You've written this book, and it really is incredible work. It's kind of, in a, way, a lot of ways, your life's work. What is the best thing that could happen? What's your hope of in releasing this book? FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Today's show is brought to you by U.S. Gold Corp. U.S. Gold Corp. is a U.S.-focused gold exploration and development company advancing high-potential projects in Wyoming and Nevada. U.S. Gold Corp. has consolidated a district on Nevada's productive cortex trend and is advancing the Copper King project towards production in Wyoming, led by a team of prolific company builders and renowned explorers, including Dave Mathewson, who is directly responsible for several major Nevada gold discoveries. U.S. Gold Corp. is well capitalized and has an extremely tight share structure with less than $20 million shares outstanding and trades on the NASDAQ, a major exchange under the ticker symbol USAU. To learn more, go to usgoldcorp.gold. That's usgoldcorp.gold. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. What changed? Well, I put in there basically the the way out, really. And we, if we simply step back and look at this, um, I mean, the cumulative interest expenditures um, have reached at times 70 percent of the national debt. So all this this nonsense, oh, you know, the, you know, we have to tax the rich and the poor. OK, well, 70, you know, when 70 percent of the national debt went out to interest. So it, it didn't go to build roads or help anybody or, or help the poor or, or nothing. I mean, it's it's all just smoke and mirrors. And um our danger now is that you've manipulated interest rates so low, um, primarily in Europe. I mean, the Fed started raising rates. They understand it. They said, we can't. This is insane. You've got pension funds going belly up all over the place because pension funds were based upon they needed 8% to break even. And um, you about double your money in less than 10 years. I mean, you went to negative interest rates in Europe. People don't realize how serious this has become. Yeah, we have all these people, you know, bashing the dollar, oh, the dollar is going to crash and because our national debt's over 20 trillion. Do you realize there is now over 17 trillion dollars of negative yielding bonds issued out of Europe? That's frightening because that totally undermines the entire capitalistic system where interest rates are supposed to reflect the risk of repayment, the risk of default. When you have negative rates, the system is not designed to uh, to be able to deal with that. It, it throws all the math out the window. And the ECB owns about 40 percent of the national debts of, of Eurozone members. And, and on top of that, they've destroyed their bond market. These things are just being handled around like punters. It's like trading gold futures. OK, nobody's actually taking delivery. Mm-mm. Um, they buy it, they sell it. That's what's been going on with the negative yielding bonds. It's not like, oh, gee, let me hold these for 30 years. Um, <laughs> no, what can I make on it? You know, the more, you know I vehicle. think it's going to go up. Yeah, I'll buy it and I'll sell it. So it's more like a game of, of musical chairs. Um, this is going to pop, I believe, next starting next year. And then when that happens, whoever's left holding these things it's going to be like, oh, gee, I didn't realize there was an actual risk with these things. Um, it, it's it's just a nightmare, a complete nightmare. And um, I mean, nobody in their right mind would have ever designed a monetary system like we have currently. I mean, it, it's just it, it's bizarre. 
So, and then you have politicians who have no clue what they're talking about. I mean, even Trump, you know, with his his trade stuff, it's still old school. Old school. He doesn't realize that it, the trade numbers are all bogus. There's nobody actually at the docks counting the number of Toyotas coming in. All they do is is look at the amount of money back and forth. That's it. And that was a system designed under Bretton Woods. It was okay when the currencies were fixed. Now you're getting into a floating exchange rate system and you get a 20% move in the currencies within two years and they start yelling at each other, oh, you got a trade surplus. And it's, it's currency movement. They don't even understand that. Mm. So, so obviously you're hoping that the right people, the, the policymakers will somehow get a hold of this book and uh, see the, uh, the evil of their ways. But we know the odds of that are not so great. But you also, we should talk about the solution that you propose for all this, which is kind of like, it's not a debt jubilee by any stretch. It's more like a debt equity swap on a national scale where, well, I'll let you explain it. Well, actually, that's one of the reasons I also put in Julius Caesar, um, because he was faced with a debt crisis and he came in and everybody expected him to to basically just wipe out all the debts because the debts were the corrupt you know, senators. He realized that if he did that, you undermine the entire capital formation of the economy. So he came up with a very interesting solution. He appointed a um, uh, like a, a commission that went out. And if you lent on a house, let's say at the time it was worth $100,000, and because real estate went down, what they were saying, OK, fine. Well, I still I want the hundred thousand. You say, well, here's the house back. No, it's got you got to give me the hundred thousand. That's what the problem was. So uh, he appointed basically a commission and they went around and all loans were reassessed at the same value when you you gave it. And whatever interest you paid had to be subtracted from what the capital you know that you owed. So he basically forgave all past interest, but he didn't wipe out the, you know, the actual loan. And we're in, the, you know, this similar situation where it's got to be the debt to equity swap because people say, oh, we'll just default on the debt. You realize if you do that, you're going to wipe out all the pension funds. Um, I mean, how many of them I mean, in the States? It's not as bad uh, as it is in Europe and Europe. Uh, private funds, or it depends upon the country, they may have to have 80 to 90 percent government invested. So you wipe out the bonds and there goes all the pension funds. I mean, you can have riots and blood in the street. So we have to understand you can't just default on the debt. Um, it's, you know, we have to get a, away from debt. We got to do a debt to equity swap sort of thing to get out of it the way I would handle a company that was in trouble. Um, and you'd have to do it in tranches. And then thereafter, prohibit government from borrowing again. It, it would be far less inflationary if you just printed what you needed and covered your expenses, which would be, you know, basically two to five percent of GDP annually, which is fine. All right. Um, they want to always increase the money supply at at least two percent for inflation to begin with. Uh, you have to kind of do that because. If, there, if the money supply remained unchanged and you had 10 people and then suddenly there's 20 people, that's deflation. You have to increase the money supply in proportion to the population. So um, we just have to get the governments out of this stuff. But politically, we have a problem here. And this is this Marxist stuff that we have. And um, I mean, I was asked by some members of Congress that I know to write this proposal up, which I did. And I said, you're really going to bring this to the floor? And they said, no, they were going to stick it in a drawer. And when the crisis hit, they would pull it out um, <laughs> at that point. And they That's said, great. look, it's like TARP. It would get voted on in a day because they need to do it. Mm -hmm. So that's their theory. So I decided, well, let me put this out in a book so everybody else understands what, what the issue is. Um, that's another one of my motives behind it. Uh, but I mean, eventually it's going to come to a, to a head. And I don't think we have more than maybe three years. Um, I would say by 2022, that's probably uh, really where you're going to see the real crisis hit. But 
now look at it from a political standpoint. You have all the Democrats standing up like Elizabeth Warren. I'll give you this for free. Vote for me. All that would end. Mm. You can't stand up and say, vote for me and I'll 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 give you this. Where does it come from? Um, So you would have to get back to more of the Austrian way, which was originally laissez faire. Um, And we did a study. You know, we we basically would take all the government statistics apart and and analyze them ourselves. And it's because all the governments use their own formulas and they're politically manipulated. Um, You want to take trade. If you take all the trade and you allocate it according to the flag the company flies, the U.S. has about a oh about a two trillion dollar surplus. Mm, um, really? So, not a negative. It's all U.S. companies oh. importing it from someplace else that they're making it. Let me ask you uh, a question. Like we're talking about government debt, but we've also got well, we've got student loan debt, we've got subprime auto debt, we've got credit card debt. Is there? a way uh, of dealing with the private debt as well along these lines? Well, the student debt, um, I really feel should be just basically um, exonerated. I mean, to some degree, at least, you, if not 100 percent, then um, the government should get out of that business. Um, as long as you're going to subsidize something along those lines, then they have no incentive to to be cost effective because they know whatever bill they send, the government will pay. And then what happened, the Clintons, who were always very close to the bankers all the time, the bankers said, well, gee, you know, we'll be glad to give more student loans, but exempt them from bankruptcy. Oh, OK, fine. So now you have all these kids with loans um, that they can't pay off and jobs that they give degrees out in anything. Uh, that are worthless. I mean, how many kids have, uh, I mean, I run into them, they're waitresses or something all the time. Most common I encounter is usually psychology. They got, you know, some masters or whatever, and they're waiting on tables because they can't find a job. So uh, universities will sell them anything. We had one girl working for us that, that had gone to school, masters, the whole bit for marine biology. Well, everybody wants to play with dolphins. <laughs> Couldn't find a job, you know. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I tell them, look, just get it. You know, if you're gonna, if you really feel you need a good degree, just get it in anything. Doesn't matter. Get it in basket weaving. I mean, I've never met somebody with a degree in economics ever as a chief financial company uh, officer in any of the major companies. Um, I would say the vast majority are usually engineers. They think better. They're taught to think. In economics, right. you're taught, okay, this is what it is, and don't say anything different because this is is Keynesian theory. And and engineers are told you got a problem that you got to figure out how to do it. And most of them are running the financial uh, operations of major companies. Uh, I don't find people with uh, even MBAs and things of this nature, you know, in, in the field, it, it's not worth a lot because they're really taught theories that no longer work. That's a big problem. Rather than being taught how to think and come up with their own theories that actually do work. And that's a big problem. They don't teach people how to think anymore in college. So subprime autos, that's becoming an issue. And credit card debt. I mean, because the problem is everybody's debt, like you said, is somebody else's asset. And in the case of uh, government debt, it's the pension funds, but it's also private debt. They own mortgage bonds. They probably own subprime auto loans, and they probably own credit card debt, too. They're dabbled in everything. So what do we do with these other debts? Uh, I'll assume that the corporations can take care of themselves, but... But these other bubbles that the, the credit card debt is very simple. Honestly, um, there used to be what we had <clears throat> called usury laws. And it was actually Paul Volcker in 19, you know, going into 1981, he wanted to raise interest rates to stop inflation. Well, he couldn't because he was exceeding the usury laws. So they had to repeal them. So they repealed them basically so he could 
take the discount rate up to 14%. Lo and behold, what does government do? They always come up with some short-term solution and they never look at it again. This is why people now are paying 20, 22% interest on credit cards. Mm -hmm. I would do the same thing there that that basically Caesar did. Whatever interest you paid, let's get this down and bring back the usury laws that cannot charge you more than 5%, period. And and if Um, if we had had that during the mortgage crisis, it would have been a crisis that we would just... Look, if we had allowed the bankruptcy courts to cram down and revalue the mortgages, that would have been the end of it because the banks would have had to negotiate and take the cut, take the haircut. They were already bailed out, so there was no reason for them not to do it. And we still see the aftermath of this, and it'll happen again, no doubt. Yeah, I mean, it's the the whole TARP thing was was, was kind of absurd in a way that um, we're okay, fine. We're, we're putting this money in the banks and hopefully they'll lend it out. And then they go, well, gee, what are we going to do with all this money? You've got to create, you know, something we, we need to, to put it back at the fed. Oh, okay, great. Well, we'll create excess reserves. All right, great. So then they put two and a half trillion dollars back into there. Yeah. What good does so that do? Wasn't the money supposed to go into the economy so that you stimulate it? That's what Not, I thought. I'm buying your bonds so then you can put it back at. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it's it doesn't even make sense. And you would think a three year old would figure this out. Um, you would think. You yeah, you really would think. I mean, it's it's just mind boggling. Um, I mean, I was starting to write some of the questions for the, uh, the House Banking Committee to ask the Fed. And one, you know, I, I wrote a few questions for him and I said, OK, fine. I put one down. I said, OK, fine. If the euro fails, what's your contingency plan? Response was, uh, well, the euro is not going to fail, so we don't have one. <laughs> OK, well, that's great. Well, that's uh, reassuring. Yeah. So this is the way it is. It, it's there is. I don't know. There, there, there is a book out why A students work for C students and B students work for government. Uh, <laughs> Which is true. I mean, the, the C student, if you look at all the like a lot of the guys that have started major companies from Bill Gates and Zuckerberg or whatever, um, they all drop out of college. Why? Because formal education is basically stuffing down your throat. This is the way it works. And you memorize this. If you answer every question correctly, you get an A. If you challenge the professor you know, they look at you as hostile. So you end up being the C student, but it's the C student who has creativity and questions. So they usually end up dropping out because they find school to be uh, really kind of ridiculous. And then on top of that, one I found really ironic, here you have Harvard and who did they ask to come back to be the speaker to the graduating class last year? Zuckerberg. Yeah. So he's going to go, okay, you're all a bunch of idiots. You you stuck it out and um, <clears throat> you got your degrees. I quit and I'm a billionaire. <laughs> <laughs> so is I mean, that I the know. right you, lesson? Why would you hire ask somebody to come back that dropped out to speak to your graduating class? I mean, it just it didn't even seem logical to me. I'd like to know that. Uh, well, I guess uh, they could have had him and uh, Bill Gates and, well, Steve Jobs, if he were alive and well, he could have come too, and they'd be a great ad for why not to go to college. You know, the, we could get into that. Uh, one thing, education, uh, I didn't notice much mention of it in your book. I mean, the book itself is educational, but we've got to do something about education as well, don't we? Well, that's why I say if you you, you deal, the first step is to deal with the student loans and, and wipe out as much of it as you can and stop this subsidize because then they just keep going, you know, and um, it's kind of like healthcare. As long as you're going to subsidize all these people, oh, we're going to create more than we're going to tax the, you know, the rich to pay for this. Nobody ever steps up and say, gee, you know, maybe we should actually look at what they're, they're charging for um, yeah. <laughs> and reform some of the problems. No, they never do that. It's always tax somebody else to pay for a system that's failed to begin with. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it's kind of really, you know, it's mind boggling how we end up with these people in government who don't, I don't know. They just, they seem to be completely incapable of making a rational decision. Mm. 
that it certainly is the case. So the book you want to check it out is Manipulating the World Economy, the Rise of Modern Monetary Theory and the Inevitable Fall of Classical Economics. Is there an alternative? Uh, is this out already on Amazon, Martin? Um, it's listed on Amazon. Um, they say it's currently unavailable. I know they got a shipment in about the 14th, I, I think. Uh, so we're waiting to see when they're going to put it, you know, make it available to buy again. Um, All right. Well, keep an eye on Amazon. You can uh, click a notification on the listing and it'll tell you when it's available. Uh, you should try to set up the listing for to take pre-orders because then uh, they'll automatically be able to place the order and get it fulfilled, especially if you know the books are there. Sometimes, you know, the robots go a little haywire in the, in those Amazon fulfillment centers and they don't know where it is, but eventually they never lose anything in those places that you can be sure Anyway, you know, all, all we heard is that they said they're probably going to sell out um, uh, right away. So I, that's all the that's all I've heard. I said, that's great, but you got to get it up. Yeah. All right. Hey, excellent. Anyway, go over to armstrongeconomics.com. Go over to Amazon. Order this book as soon as it's out. Do it quickly because it ain't going to be around for long. And you'll just have to wait for the reprinting. I know uh, numerous people are going to buy it. and. Martin, it's always great to have you on. Just to go over to our site, financialsurvivalnetwork.com. You can see all of the other interviews that I've done with Martin over the years. Uh, some of them are downright prescient, especially about the stock market. Uh, we were talking when you know it was down in the high teens, not down, but it was in the high teens, and you said, just wait. And sure enough, look, we waited, and we see what's happening, and really... I'm inclined to agree with you. When people tell me, Martin, that the stock market can't go any higher, you know what I tell them? I said, I know that's what you think, but I've been uh, talking to Martin Armstrong for years. When the market was d well below 20,000, he's the only person who's been correct about its uh, ascendancy and its continued ascendancy. You, you know that old saying, Martin, you remember, uh, Mark Twain, they said he was dead. It was in the newspapers. And he sent back a telegram that said, uh, you know, dear public, uh, rumors of my death have been greatly exaggerated. Rumors of this bull market's death have been greatly exaggerated and keep coming up. But uh, I'm inclined with Martin to agree that it will keep going up until something major occurs, something across the world, a shot heard across the world. Anyway, Martin, always great to have you. Thank you so much. And we will be following up. Uh, we're probably going to do a webinar so we, you can get in your questions to Martin. We'll take everybody's questions. We'll go for an hour or so. Really appreciate it, Martin. We'll talk to you again real soon. Okay. Thank you for inviting me. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next.